that. So a very warm welcome to you all to today's talk. Um, my name is Bethany Gaunt and I am Associate Director of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre. The centre, which was created by Lady Esther Gilbert and Sir Harry Solomon, was established a few years ago with the intention of continuing to shine a light on the areas of history to which Sir Martin dedicated his life. Over the course of his career, Sir Martin wrote a huge number of books on 20th century topics, including the World Wars, the Holocaust and Israel. Sir Martin communicated his research in his writing and talks with such clarity and precision, all the while engaging his audience. The centre's aim is to bring the same precision to, and, and the passion for history to our audiences and continue to further Sir Martin's legacy. I have just a couple of points to make before I introduce our speaker tonight. The first is that we are a charity and we rely on donations. If you would like to support our work, it is now easy to donate on our website and I'll add the link into the chat in just a moment. It goes without saying that we are immensely grateful for the donations we receive. Secondly, we are recording tonight's talk, as you will have noticed when you joined the event, um, and I'll send a link out to attendees tomorrow. And please do feel free to share the recording with anyone you think might enjoy it. Now, it gives me very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sabina Tanovich to your screens this evening for a talk on the architecture of commemoration. As an award-winning architect, Sabina's specialism is slightly different from that of our usual speakers, but in memory sites, architecture and history, of course, go hand in hand. I hope Sabina doesn't mind, but I'm going to quote a line from the conclusion of her book now, because it describes this relationship so elegantly. So she writes, memorial architecture makes time understandable and history palpable. Those of you who attended the talk that Lady Esther Gilbert gave last summer, Travels with an Historian, will remember the various examples she gave of Sir Martin's lifelong interest in sites of commemoration. And I'm sure we have all experienced history made palpable at a given site of commemoration. So tonight we'll be hearing an insider's perspective on memory sites from Sabina. Sabina graduated from the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Sarajevo and holds a master's and doctoral degree from Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, where she is currently based. Her work focuses on contemporary memorial projects and traumascapes. Sabina is involved in a number of fascinating and significant projects. She is currently a scientific advisor in the steering committee for the NAP National Srebrenica Genocide Memorial Initiative in The Hague and is working on an interdisciplinary project that aims to preserve war heritage in Sarajevo by means of digital technologies. She is on the advisory board for a European project entitled Houses of Darkness, Images of a Contested European Memory, which grapples with representing the history of perpetratorship to young audiences. So, with all of those different plates to spin, we are very lucky to have her here today. Sabina's talk for us is based on the research she published in her recent book, which I have here, Designing Memory, the Architecture of Commemoration in Europe, 1914 to the Present, which I have been reading with great interest. Sabina is going to talk for roughly 40 minutes, and then we will have time for some questions at the end. As always, please feel free to message those to me privately or put them in the general chat. But without further ado, Sabina, thank you so much for joining us and I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Bethany, for this uh, kind uh, introduction. And thank you everybody for joining tonight. Um, I understand it's late and um, maybe you're also as tired as I am. <laughs> Um, but it feels really good to um, talk about my book uh, tonight because it was published just before the pandemics. And I feel like going back uh, to some, some sort of normality now because a lot of my talk, book talks were cancelled um, and I didn't do them really online. So I will um, share my screen um, to immediately start with my presentation. Um, uh, so I thought before I uh, 
start to talk about my book and what the book is about, I need to give some context on uh, from which the book derives, really. And um, and my own fascination with uh, memorial architecture. And it started uh, more or less when I stumbled upon um, uh, Edvard Lilienthal's book, Preserving Memory, uh, where he describes the struggle uh, to uh, create and build a United States Holocaust Museum in Washington. Uh, and it was a fascinating read, really, because it opened up the whole world that I didn't know about. Um, and I read it, I think it was just uh, in the 90s when the book was actually published, more or less. And uh, uh, there, is, there I found also this uh, caricature from, from Rob Rogers, uh, on which he portrays Bill Clinton. And he's looking uh, here on the left, he's looking at the Vietnam uh, uh, War Memorial, and he's thinking we can't afford to go into Bosnia. And then on the right, he's looking at the US Holocaust Museum, just newly built then and he thinks and we cannot afford not to go and uh, for me this was really intriguing to think that um, one of these buildings and both of them really had any you know impact on the course uh, of the war that was happening in Bosnia in the beginning in Bosnia and Herzegovina the beginning of the 90s um, uh, when the siege of Sarajevo, I originally come from Sarajevo and I lived through the siege of Sarajevo, but I'm not going to describe now what that meant and what that was like. But if I can kind of, a, if I would choose a symbolic image to represent that experience, uh, that could be this one, um, uh, where Veteran Smilovic, um, also known as Cellist of Sarajevo, is performing his, uh, one of his 22 performances for 22 people who were murdered in one of the first massacres that happened in, uh, during the siege of Saira was at the very beginning. And 22 people were murdered in the line uh, while, while waiting for bread. Uh, and he decided to perform 22 times at different locations, exposing his you know, life uh, to snipers and, and shells from the hills that were surrounding the, the, the city. And here he's playing uh, surrounded with the ruins of the Bern National Library. Uh, in which, in fire, in which I think 2,000, 2 million books uh, were also burned. Uh, so for me, uh, this shows the human resilience amidst um, um, destruction. And um, uh, to kind of just give you a little more context uh, uh, and information about fascination with memorial architecture, um, Here's a kind of a map of Sarajevo and how Sarajevo was besieged um, for almost four years. Um, so the red is the siege line. And uh, when I was a graduate student at the Faculty of Architecture at the University in Sarajevo, I decided to do a memorial project for a so-called Tunnel Day Bay. And that is here, uh, you see this airport, a blue mark, and uh, beneath the airport runway was a clandestine structure that basically um, we could argue saved the city because it was a lifeline for the, for the completely besieged city during those four years. So I was fascinated um, after the siege, I was fascinated with this very project and also with many other stories and I wanted to learn experiences of other people next to my own experience. Um, so I decided to make the memorial, um, memorial Museum for Sarajevo, that was my graduation project in 2006. And with this project, I, as you can see, the architecture is really dark and I tried com to communicate my own kind of a traumatic experience and to uh, bring together all these other uh, stories and symbols of, of the siege. Um, the project was received very well. I, I, I got the highest mark and um, I was happy with, with, with the result, but at the same time, I realized how little I knew about what memorial architecture really is, because uh, as a designer, you get you know education in, in a history of architecture, quite general, but there is no specific knowledge about memorial architecture itself, actually very little, almost none. So uh, for me, this project only opened up many questions. Um, and uh, on, to kind of point to only a few of those questions, I wondered what the difference is between a monument and the memorial, because I noticed that these two kind of are, are used inter, uh, uh, constantly in texts and projects, but there is no really distinction between the two. And I felt that there is one. Uh, so I wanted to understand this and how memorial architecture can support really individual and collective processes of mourning. 
uh, and also how is memorial architecture appropriated by people. Um, so these questions led me then to uh, really extensive um, research that uh, culminated in my uh, doctorate um, thesis uh, I, I defended in 2015. And uh, throughout this research, I um, visited also a lot of memorial sites and talked with a lot of manager managerial teams and people visiting these sites and interviewed a lot of people to kind of try to understand the dynamics and categories of, of the spaces of remembrance in Europe. So essentially, this is uh, where the book I'm going to talk about now comes from. Uh, it took me about four years of rethinking and editing, uh, reconsidering some ideas from my PhD, uh, and also trying then to condense a lot of information into yeah, quite limited format, uh, in my view, uh, but to make it also you know, accessible for, for more general public. Um, so now finally, I am going to talk about the book. Um, and basically, it is uh, constructed on two parts. So the first part I call scaffolding memory, uh, which is uh, giving, uh, creating framework for the second part of the book. And these are case studies. Um, so the first part um, essentially has two chapters. The, the first chapter is commemorative architecture since uh, 1914. Uh, which is basically a, a historical overview, a brief historical overview of uh, the evolution of a memorial genre, if, if I can say it like that. And the second chapter is uh, called the dual uh, role of memorial architecture, um, which I will expl explain a little later. So the, the, the first chapter, <clears throat> I decided to start with the First World War, precisely because the First World War was the watershed period for the evolution of memorial architecture. This was after the First World War, the, a demand for new uh, kind of aesthetic language, commemorative language it was so great that designers were faced with this uh, um, a completely new set of requirements and they had to produce uh, different and um, uh, well, more suitable, if you will, language for commemoration. Um, so here I look at some quite known projects like Tipfal and Ypres in Belgium that uh, uh, for the first time in, uh, incorporated this notion of memorial and spatial uh, architectural um, uh, uh, um, uh, space for remembrance, but also Germany and Italy and other countries in Europe. Uh, because some of these projects, like the Italian ones, and in a way also German ones, served also as, or their purpose was to kind of a set stage for the nascent Nazism and fascism that was already uh, gearing up in Europe um, at the time. And importantly, I'm not looking only at um, realized projects or so built projects, but I'm looking at projects that are conceptual uh, or so-called paper architecture projects that uh, I would argue are sometimes even more influential than the built ones. Like the one here, we see Giuseppe Terani's uh, Danteum uh, that was uh, basically created in the context of uh, fascism. And uh, the, the goal of this project was to kind of uh, elevate the ideas of uh, that the yeah, fascists proposed at the time, but at the same time, this project introduced uh, really novel solutions, spatial ideas and con con concepts that we can see later in other projects uh, for completely different contexts. Uh, one, here on these sketches, we can see uh, glass pillars, for instance, which was very unusual at the time. Uh, Terani wanted to kind of dematerialize the, 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 the architecture itself to communicate higher ideals, let's say. Um, after the Second World War, then this um, this language of dematerialization, higher goals, uh, morphed into something else because, of course, the unprecedented trauma of the Second World War and the death of civilians. Uh, here is one of the first. Uh, then I look uh, um, also chronologically at projects that developed after the S Second World War. Here is one of the first uh, memorial museums and memorial sites, also in Italy. Um, 
uh, where we can see, and this is quite characteristic then for architecture uh, after the Second World War, which is really heavy, uh, kind of a somber, trying to communicate the, the, the trauma and, uh, and um, impossibility of hope uh, at times. Uh, this is Fossa Adertin and next to Rome, we're close to Rome. And then again, some of the conceptual projects that are really interesting to look at is, for example, uh, here, uh, so-called The Road, which was the winner of the first competition for the official international uh, uh, um, competition for the commemoration of Auschwitz-Birkenau. And the Polish team of architects led by Oskar Hansen, a renowned Polish architect, they proposed not to build anything on the site, but to literally Im implement a kind of a black tarmac road that would cut, run across the site. And everything that was supposed to be on the road would be preserved as in for the purpose of remembering and preserving memory. Everything outside the road uh, was uh, supposed to be led to the ravages of time. And in this way, they wanted to uh, um, give the responsibility of remembrance to the visitor, not only to architect, architecture, architecture, which was originally, traditionally, uh, always the case. Um, so as Oskar Hansen argued or explained, he said that the road is the exploration of continuity. It departs from life, transgresses death, and returns again to another life. Life and death are defined through each other. So this sentiment of uh, a continuity of uh, evolution um, coming back to life, life and death, um, exchanging roles and, uh, you know, the, um, the materialization of, of architecture itself was quite, uh, well, I don't know if I can say popular, but it was very interesting for designers and, uh, again, in different contexts. So the ideas traveled across contexts, really. And here we see Louis Kahn, again, a conceptual work. Uh, that aims to do uh, almost the same uh, with his conceptual design for um, for a memorial for how what is it? it was called I think officially uh, a memorial memorial for six million murdered um, Jewish martyrs sorry that was uh, supposed to be built in New York um, and Khan here again uses kind of a language that we saw with Terani before. Uh, for a uh, purpose of commemorating uh, Jewish martyrs. Uh, other projects such as uh, Deportation Memorial in Paris uh, uh, introduces again something new, which is uh, really this architecture parlant, but then in, um, um, in, with the purpose of communicating trauma. Uh, so he designs sequences of spaces that are uh, actually hidden in public spaces. So the space, the whole memorial has to be discovered. So this is also something new that we didn't see before, that the memorial is actually um, hidden, but then once it's entered, you enter a completely different world that um, takes you in, uh, in this narrative of trauma. Um, and I briefly also look at the context of, um, um, countries that were officially then in the Eastern Bloc, also including Ukraine, but uh, more notably Yugoslavia, because, because Yugoslavia is known for many um, very rich memorial uh, architecture culture and designers in Yugoslavia had uh, relatively uh, uh, a lot of freedom actually to express themselves, uh, of course, within the framework of uh, patriotic, patriotic narrative. Um, and uh, um, in this, they managed to um, create very innovative forms at the time. And perhaps what is also really interesting is that they paid attention to psychological aspects of experiencing designs. And uh, characteristically, for Yugoslavian uh, memorial architecture, it was the museums, the memorial museums were really prominently also featuring in many of these projects that were normally placed on, you know, famous battle battlefields and so on. And memorial museums would always, well, not always, but in most cases would accompany uh, figural, figurative um, uh, uh, monuments or sculptural monuments. Uh, some, of, some of them you can see here on these images. And then uh, in this chapter, I'm still in this first chapter because it's really uh, uh, packed with information. So I want to kind of try to break it down for you. But uh, I recognize these four periods. So after the First World War and after the Second World War and then after 1980s, 
because then uh, something uh, new again happened and um, what we can see after 1980s is that there is a really strong accent on the notion of healing uh, through memorial architecture. And one of the famous exa examples is the Vietnam uh, Veterans War Memorial in Washington. Uh, but also the counter memory generation, um, proponent of which is James Young, but um, and other people also wrote extensively about uh, artists from counter memory generations generation, sorry. Uh, most prominently, they were working in Germany. And here's the famous example, a famous monument against fascism in, in hum Hamburg and uh, Harburg, sorry. And uh, the idea behind this monument was that uh, it aimed to kind of destabilize the very notion of erecting, creating spaces for remembrance in public space in the first uh, as an idea, as a concept. So this monument uh, uh, was sunk into the ground uh, over the course of a few years, and people were invited to write whatever they wanted on the surface of the monument. And today it's completely under the ground, and only this sentence stands there, uh, saying that nothing can in the long run replace our own protest against injustice. Um, but this kind of the idea that is behind counter memory generation, we can see uh, already with, with Oscar Hansen and other projects that um, originated immediately after the Second World War. Um, and then uh, again, to kind of a, um, show how ideas and uh, um, travel across contests, contexts, this is a project again in Italy, uh, which has nothing to do with the war with the Second World War, but um, I, here I want to show this idea of filling and creating voids with memorial architecture. And this is a project by an artist, uh, Buri, uh, Italian artist who uh, commemorated the destructed village. Uh, village was destructed by earthquake and he with huge amounts of concrete basically preserved the layout of the village. So you can today walk um, still on, on once uh, um, existing streets that are actually still existing now, but you walk among these concrete blocks. Uh, so in a way he preserves the historical place, but he also preserved the trauma of what happened. And this uh, concept, this approach, we can also see in the first proposal of actually second competition because the first one failed for the National Memorial um, in Berlin, uh, so um, known as a memorial for the murdered Jews of Europe uh, <clears throat> that was in, officially inaugurated in 2005, but there were two, uh, one unex, unsu unsuccessful and then successful competition. Uh, and this proposal um, implies the same technique um, was then built in a very modified form. Uh, and this is how we know it today. And it is interesting because um, it still provokes discussion. Um, and there were many editions that were that that, uh, that found place in this memorial afterwards, uh, namely the Memorial Museum under the under the memorial. Uh, so with this, I kind of uh, finish this chapter with discussion also about what it means to commemorate and create memorial architecture today. And then I go to the second chapter of this first part, which was probably the most difficult chapter for me to write because here I left my comfort zone of architectural history and I embarked on uh, something that really interested me and still interests me, but I know so little about. So I literally touch upon subjects <clears throat> such as collective traumatic memory and how it is constructed. How do we come to terms with loss and in individual mourning, uh, designing spaces for traumatic memory and mourning, and then in the final subchapter with fundamental elements of engage, engagement, engagement, I try to kind of a, a bridge the knowledge and cues I take from, you know, psychology, uh, cultural anthropology, political science, uh, politics of memory, and architecture itself. Uh, I don't know how successful I am in this, but for sure I admit that this was really difficult to write, but at the same time the most interesting, perhaps. Um, if I would kind of try to summarize or convey the main um, message of that part of that chapter of my book, it would be, it, um, it is conveyed in a way in this um, sentence, <clears throat> so it doesn't want to heal the Nichnarben, and that is part of, of this memorial project, which is um, officially in Saarbrücken, that is really at the on the border between uh, France and Germany, 
and uh, commemorates uh, um, a camp that a Nazi camp that used to exist on this site. So a small camp uh, uh, that uh, was not commemorated for a long time properly. There were some minor uh, memorial plaques and so on, but um, only in the 2000s, I think they, there was the, the, the commission to really uh, create a memorial for this site. And in my view, this memorial is really interesting or a good example of how architecture, memorial architecture can um, create levels of engagement. And here, like on the left image, there is the, you know, the first impression, there is the facade of the building. And um, uh, once we uh, go beyond that facade, uh, that layer, we enter a completely different space, which is um, here behind the facade. And that is the space where we have didactic content, we have the historical site, we have art. And then on, in a third layer, uh, there is, um, uh, um, uh, uh, it, it's interesting to see how this memorial connects to the contemporary situation. So the site ev evolved since the Second World War, new functions are there, there is a hotel. Uh, um, and uh, what do you do then? How do you commemorate uh, or preserve the sense of place in such a site? And here we can see the portrait on the facade here of the hotel is a portrait of one person who was uh, imprisoned in this camp. Um, so to go back to this uh, uh, last part of this chapter, I, where I said I try to uh, bridge knowledge from different disciplines uh, and architecture, I uh, use actually funerary architecture as a source for uh, understanding rituals uh, of mourning. And I try to follow and understand how architecture follows the ritual itself. And there I make distinction between three really um, kind of a simple but um, um, uh, important steps in architectural experience. And these are the entrance. So when something is introduced and then we have a path which is a liminal period, period of transition towards something and then room as a, as a, as a space that is designed to convey a, a certain meaning. Uh, and then uh, this brings me to the part two of my book, which is basically my case studies. Uh, and here I decided to cut, uh, make a categorization of three typologies uh, according to the purpose. And uh, the first is memorials to the victims of terrorism and then memorial museums and finally war memorials. Uh, and memorials to the victims of terrorism, <clears throat> I look at uh, a number of memorials and monuments in Europe that are dedicated to different uh, acts of terrorism, victims of different acts of terrorism. But I go in depth uh, with looking at the memorial um, in Madrid, uh, which is dedicated to people who were murdered at um, in the terroristic attack in 2004. Um, and I will just, I will not now go into details about this project, but what is important to say is that this, um, case study really shows why the agency of the designer is important and how it can change the, uh, the way uh, commemorative project is um, created in the end. Because here the designers went against the original uh, program of demands, which was set forth by the commissioner. Uh, and they, instead of having just the monument, as you can see in this image here, this is a Tocha station, the commissioners only wanted a simple monument on the roundabout in front of the station, but designers argued for a space underneath, which was needed uh, as a space for mourning and reflection, and indeed this was realized in the end. And then I look at other different contexts, as I said, uh, but perhaps most informative and relatively recent was the one in Norway um, and the process of creating different memorials in Norway uh, dedicated to the victims of uh, uh, an attack from uh, 2011. And uh, here is um, uh, we can learn uh, from this process uh, in, in a way, when you look how actually soon the memorial was um, uh, imagined to be created and designed after the attack itself in a top-down approach. That is this one on the, on the left here. Uh, and eventually added, ended up in, in court uh, for different reasons. Um, and then 
we can see a, a couple of other memorials that were then erected after that uh, failed attempt to create an uh, official memorial that uh, was th these processes were more informed by grassroots mourning. Uh, they were more inclusive in, in a sense that they invited families and uh, of, of, of the victims to participate and you know create these places together. Um, and then also Brussels again confirms why is it important to uh, to observe and invite people, especially after uh, such a severe, sudden, and recent uh, atrocities uh, like uh, terrorist attacks in this case. In uh, part memorial museums, that is basically a compar comparative study where I look at two Holocaust memorial museums that were inaugurated in the same year uh, in different countries. So on the left is um, a memorial museum in, in Mechelen in Belgium, and on the right is uh, Drancy in, in France. Um, and I compare them because they, uh, in a very quite different way, architecturally, conceptually, react to a very similar uh, situation um, so they are both adjacent to a place uh, which was originally a housing, both were originally housing blocks uh, that during the Second World War were, were uh, uh, turned into, uh, into camps, um, uh, transitional camps from which people were further deported uh, to death camps and work camps. Um, and today both are again housing projects, people are again living in, this, in these buildings, but museums are uh, uh, aiming to connect or not con connect depending on the context here to the original site. And I think it's really fruitful discussion uh, in, my, um, in my evaluation. I think that one project does it somewhat better than the other. Um, and then finally war memorials. Um, and so essentially, I look here at uh, First World War memorials uh, because uh, I wanted also to come back to that point that First World War was really a watershed period for the evolution of memorial architecture. Uh, uh, and um, for example, here, the Ring of Memory is one of my case studies. And it is interesting to see uh, how designers of this project uh, reference a lot of historical examples that I also discuss in the book. But at the same time, they bring forth uh, some new and innovative ideas that I'm sure the future designers will use um, and can be used uh, uh, for future commemorations. Um, and also, again, a conceptual project uh, for the Flanders fields in Belgium, a really complex um, uh, project that was conceived by an interdisciplinary team, which is a very important um, effect or, um, if for, if for, um, in creating memorial architecture like this. And the project aims to uh, uh, observe and analyze the existing sites and uh, former battlefields of the First World War in the region, and to see how they can be reconceptualized in contemporary situations. So not only to preserve the sense of place where it's possible, but also to, to try to um, um, uh, connect these uh, remembrances, let's say, with new infrastructure, with uh, plans for the future, with tourism and other aspects that are relevant um, today. Um, so by some kind of a way of conclusion, um, uh, there are, I would say that the, the book itself, the research only opened up even more questions than I started with. Um, but if I can um, focus on the most important um, uh, points um, that I myself learned from the whole project, um, that research, sorry, that would be that um, more or less in one way or another, all of these projects, they aim uh, at social sustainability. And with a different uh, degree of success, uh, they managed to create this uh, through appropriation, allowing appropriation of space for visitors by visitors. Um, and they use different methods, different, different ways to do this. And I think it's really interesting to see and to learn from these projects. 
Uh, then the, the aspect of sense of place and the sense of space are uh, two crucial uh, components in, in designing memorial architecture and that eventually they can actually be reinforced and bring forward uh, by the craftsmanship of a designer. Uh, um, and uh, finally, the process of creating um, is uh, um, important because you know, when you have architectural production, when you're making a building, there, there's a set of rules and stages and phases that have to happen before a building is constructed. And this is more or less standardized. Um, and then depending on the utility and the purpose of the building, they vary to a certain degree. Um, but I would argue that memorial architecture is perhaps one of the most complex um, uh, pro one of the most complex projects that we can have uh, because they next to all this, uh, but standard or you know regular architectural production uh, 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 is, there's also the whole set of issues uh, and um, uh, many more stakeholders in the process. There's also socio-political and cultural aspects that uh, feature prominently in these projects. Um, so this is why I think that um, uh, looking at history uh, and uh, projects like this can be really informative and useful um, for designers, but also for, uh, for uh, all, uh, um, uh, many other disciplines and generally for the society. Um, and then to kind of go back to where I started, uh, I'm currently busy with, uh, uh, again, with the Tunnel Debe Memorial Museum, uh, with, I actually, if you remember, I said I graduated with this project in the beginning in 2006, so funny enough, 10 years after there was an anonymous competition um, uh, for, for making a memorial museum and research center on this, on that very site because the demand is growing, tourists are coming, the, the memorial complex is extending. So I, I decided to participate and reconsider my initial design and I won the competition. So for me, that was a way also kind of a confirmation that this makes sense, you know, uh, learning and looking at memorial architecture and the history of memorial architecture makes sense um, uh, in creating um, new projects really. And, this is really my final um, slide. Um, I, I um, started with Vedran Smilovic playing in, um, in the burned National Library in Sarajevo. And I saw this image just recently. I think it's a, a, a chalice from uh, Kharkiv in Ukraine. And unfortunately, it only, it only confirms that um, the memorial architecture and the way we remember and commemorate in space uh, is still and remains a, a, a really important subject. Uh, and uh, I'm really shaken by what is going on now in Ukraine, precisely because I know how much trauma, how much damage is made um, and how much effort and time it will take um, uh, in commemorating, in dealing with, with what, is, what is being done now. Uh, precisely because in the case of Sarajevo, um, uh, the uh, issue of commemoration is still ongoing, is still unsettled. Uh, we are still searching for um, suitable language, if you will. Um, and um, it is 30 years apart, they are 30 years apart, these two images. Uh, so I'm hoping, and this is why we also wrote to Association of Architects in Ukraine, if we can be of any help, because we also do have some knowledge from what we experienced in Sarajevo, also in terms of cultural pr protection of cultural heritage, architectural heritage, and what will then after the war is over become war heritage. Uh, so yeah, with this, I would like to finish and thank you. Um, I hope I was uh, okay with time, Bethany. Um, You're perfect with time. Yeah, thank you okay. So much. Yes, that it's was always strange to like, it feels like talking to yourself. Uh, let me just stop sharing. I don't know. Ah, oh, yeah. Uh, no, wait.
Thank yeah. you. That was, I know it, it's very, very hard when you're doing a presentation, especially because we all disappear from your screen, but we're all still here. Yeah, this, is, this, this, <laughs> this was confronting. First time I did a Zoom presentation, and it still is confronting. I just cannot get used to it. No, but that was a brilliant presentation. Thank you so much. And a really poignant note to end on there, the circling back, you know, years yeah, later. Yeah, yeah exactly. Similar. Yeah, exactly. Because for me, I really, I'm really moved when I, when I, every time I see that image and it's, I think just happening. Um, and then I think of Vedran Smilovic because for him, um, as I said, he played 22 times to commemorate 22 people who were murdered at the first massacre in Sarajevo. And that was, that was human resilience and kind of an impromptu commemoration, immaterial commemoration, if you will. On, on, on site, you know, on place. And it was so needed for the citizens of Sarajevo back then to hear him play um, uh, uh, as a kind of, you know, uh, resistance also mm -hmm. against the, the destruction. Because he himself was also, you know, exposed to, as I said, snipers and, and, and simply was, um, it was possibility to be killed. Even his cello was destroyed at one point. Wow. But it really meant a lot. So seeing that now again, like literally I'm at one point thinking, am I 92 or 2022, you know, 30 years apart and feels like some kind of memory loop happening. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, I imagine there'll be some big discussions to be had about memorials for, for what's going on currently in, in future years. So it's it's very sad that it keeps coming around. Um, we've got lots of questions, which is great. Right. I think people really enjoyed your talk. Um, so I'm going to choose a few and I'll try and get through as many as we can, if that's all right with you. <laughs> um, so someone has asked, is there a fundamental difference between memorials in situ, so where, where people were murdered, for example, and those that are erected elsewhere, for example, in a city centre, um, and the thought processes behind that, I suppose? Yeah, yeah, this is a good question, because this is also something I'm always looking at when I visit sites of remembrance. And um, um, as I said, this sense of place and sense of space is are two different components in designing. But sense of place, that is something, you know, place memory, that is something that's embedded in the place. And sometimes that's not visible um, unless you have knowledge, of course, of what happened or memory of certain place. But again, through a design of craftsmanship of the designer of the architect um, or, you know, thoughtful commemoration, uh, this can be kind of a, the, the invisible is then uh, uh, again visible, becomes visible again, let's say. So uh, in that sense, um, I would always say that, you know, if that, and that is easier, perhaps, I'm not sure, but arguably it's easier to achieve on the authentic site than on the non-authentic site. Because on the non-authentic site, then you need, um, um, a, 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 let's say, additional set of um tools or ideas to kind of, uh, um, but again, depends on the context. So it's not, I cannot generalize, but if you have authentic site, of course, it contributes to the, to the overall experience of, of place, for yeah. sure. That, that makes sense. And I think that ties into a question that's just come in. Um, let me try and find it, which was, uh, how do you determine uh, if, a if a memorial is successful? Is that to do with the sort of authenticity of the experience? And... Yeah, there is a lot of research and also ongoing research uh, uh, in the field of memory studies. Um, it's really prolifer prolific uh, uh, field, you know, that's growing, I think, uh, constantly. Um, and uh, a lot of accent lately is put on visitor research to really understand how visitors experience spaces. And I know some relatively new research on um, cultural psychology that, you know, follows people um, uh, when they go through a memorial to see what are their reactions, how, uh, because we, I think uh, we are lacking in this research to really be sure to say people experience this or this or that way. It's always kind of a limited um, uh, limited kind of a view on, on what people really experience, I guess. 
sorry, what was exactly the question? I kind of drifted away when you. It, it was how do how do you determine whether a memorial a is success, successful? A rate of success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of avoid to say whether something is successful or not. Uh, of you know because there is of course the level of individual individual individualization. I guess uh, each one of us experienced you know space differently. We have different triggers. Mm -hmm. uh so this is something that's difficult to to determine and but there are some general characteristics and also how thinking from a designing point of view how designers create spaces you know there's a certain set of strategies that you use uh, to create an effective space you know we know what works what doesn't work on your senses mm -hmm. and sensory architecture is also really important um Again, there is new research that shows, you know, that also some historic monuments are built in a certain way. So the acoustic breaks exactly in a way that can influence you, you know. Uh, so, yeah, there is that for sure. So from a designer perspective, I could say, yeah, this is a bit more successful. This is less successful. Mm -hmm. But again, there are all these other issues that depending on the context. And for me, primarily, I always look how, how is something situated in community? You know, so not only architectural value of a project. Uh, for example, when I visited um, Vardo in Norway, that is a memorial that is dedicated to uh, people, women mostly, who were burned as witches in the 16th, 17th century. And beautiful memorial by Peter Zumthor, really renowned architect, Swiss architect, and uh, Louis Bourgeois uh, artist. Uh, is there so you you are no you, the feeling is you are at the end of the world and there is this beautiful memorial um, you know you enter it there is a, this scenography the walls are moving when the wind is blowing everything is there but then you go outside and you talk with locals and they are completely disconnected from this place uh, we're not even asked whether that makes any sense to make it there or not and then you learn about the process you know and then for me that matters mm -hmm. you know because these are the things i personally look at yeah uh, so as a pilgrimage for an architect yes you know it's really worth going there but as a, as a memorial concept in a local community i don't know okay yeah, yeah that that makes sense thank you um perhaps you can comment on someone's asked what do you consider to be the most poignant memorial in europe probably you have a quite a list <laughs> that stand out but it's probably yeah, difficult to is, put, pick one. That is a very difficult question. Yeah, because I, I honestly, I don't know if I can uh, answer it even because, uh, uh, yeah, I have now a lot in my head, actually. But sometimes, and actually, uh, even the grassroots memorials, you know, how they develop in public space can be uh, uh, very poignant. And actually, uh, okay, I will just say what first comes in my head. And that was Salaspil's memorial. Uh, I visited with my children a couple of years ago um, in Riha, close to Riha. And uh, uh, we went there, beautiful landscape, uh, really interesting memorial, I think built in the 70s. I'm not sure now, but it was really interesting how it was developed. Also, there was this sculptural work. But for me, the most poignant there was to see the children's memorial and that people, even today, constantly, they come and then they bring teddy bears, flowers, you know, materials there, messages on, on, this, on this place. So uh, even though it's not perhaps maintained properly, you know, due to political issues going on, and I don't know, but the memorial itself is alive and people appropriate it as a space for... Yeah. For morning and this i find really poignant when you know memorials continue to live mm -hmm. sometimes in spite of political contestation um that made me think of another question that i had just read which is a good one um sorry there's so many questions i will try and get as to as many as i can um so someone's asked uh does memorial architect architecture unify nations or create controversy that opens emotional sores in your experience what's been the predominant uh yeah well most recent example for example here is in, in amsterdam I, i'm now in the netherlands i live there and uh, i followed how the uh, the first official national memorial dutch memorial to um, murdered jews of holland of netherlands some hundred thousand people uh, are commemorated now in Amsterdam, in the center of the city. 
And it was a long process of, um, I think, 12 years to already to even find a location for the memorial. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, I think the association who is behind, they're officially the commissioner, a Jewish association, they did a great job uh, in like, you could adopt a name from a memorial, you know, and that way they sponsored the, the creation of the memorial and so on. But what for me was controversial was how this, again, this process of creating was um, because it's such an important um, national, you know, memorial of, memorial of significance. Uh, for, um, these things should be done and need to be done through open competitions, through, you know, inviting young young designers to think about it, inviting, you know, anonymously. I think in that way, uh, you also bring more value to, to something, to the whole idea of commemorating something so important in, in public space. And then, you know, the context, thinking about people who will live next to these memorials on a daily basis. Okay, I'm the visitor, I come there for a day or two and I go away. But it was, you know, in the middle of a housing district. So you are looking at this every morning. So it also does something to people, you know. So all these issues have to be considered. And then uh, while everyone in the Netherlands agrees, more or less, let's say that th such a memorial should happen in public space in Amsterdam, because 100,000 Jews were deported by Dutch bureaucracy, you know, they were selected. And, uh, and uh, 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 at the same time, the project ended up in court, because the residents sued the, the commissioner, uh, not because, you know, they think there should not be a memorial, but because the, of the way it, it is done. Mm -hmm. And what the commissioner did, he invited the star architect, uh, Daniel Liebeskind, to just give a present to the city, you know, and I'm really, uh, I'm really not a proponent of this kind of so you, this is for me a clear example when even when some, everyone agrees on something, there is a contestation. Uh, you know, it's already such a difficult process. You don't want to end up in court on top of no. everything that you have to deal with. So why not learn? You know, th this is something. Uh, so I hope this answers the question. I'm not sure. Actually. I think so. Yes. Thank you. Um, someone else has asked your opinion on the, pr forgive my pronunciation, the Stolpes. <laughs> the yeah. stumbling stones mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you yeah yeah it's a really i even i mention it in my book of course because it's such an important project uh stepping stones and uh um uh, i think it's really um for me i connected also with sarah roses in a way i don't know if you know about sarah roses are also kind of a documentary natured memorials they basically uh, where grenades fell in the city, these places are marked with red raisin. Uh, and they do, don't belong really to anyone. They, they are kind of ambiguous, um, you know, memorials that belong to all citizens of Sarajevo, which makes them problematic for maintenance, let's say. <laughs> That's why they're disappearing in a way from the city tissue. But um, the stepping stones in, for me are something in this context, they're similar because, you know, you kind of, you, you see, uh, you see these names in the pavement, and then you realize that they're the place memory. You know that this is this is what I, I think also mentioned now in the talk. And was it was interesting also to see this development that some of the survivors' families and uh, other institutions. I don't know who it was in question now exactly. I think in Austria that they didn't like that the stones are in the ground that they wanted because they find it disgraceful. They want them on the facades. You know that, that they didn't they didn't want people to walk over them. Um, so. Again, here you have contestation in a way, you know, how to design, how to make it respectful, what is the language, but I find them really poignant. And personally for me, they, they are uh, something like Sarajevo Roses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we've got time for two questions more. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go with this one as our penultimate one. This is very interesting. So someone's asked, given that some people want passionately to forever remember what others may wish to forever forget, um, how do we decide what to memorialize? Yes, this is something I also discuss in the book in that very difficult chapter for me, because uh, uh, to forget is healthy. There is, you know, we have to forget to live. We cannot remember everything. And in a way, architecture also served throughout centuries and, you know, also memorial architecture serves as sort of parmacon where, when we, you know, inscribe on it and we can leave it there and forget about it. So as a kind of a relief, 
but as you could see in my presentations, there are a lot of the, um, uh, works that want to avoid exactly this. Mm -hmm. They don't want architecture to have this responsibility. They want us to remember to you know keep being responsible and active, engaged in that way. Um, so, but that is always a difficult discussion, but every process of designing of mediation of memory means that you have to select, you cannot represent everything. Yeah. Only in a living archive, perhaps if you create the platform for something to kind of grow organically from itself, and then there is no really system or I don't know, like I'm just brainstorming that quick can happen. But, uh, again, to, to create a good framework for such a discussion, I think we need to look at history and to you know, projects that yeah. manage to do this. Yeah, brilliant. Um, which brings us to our last question. I'm gonna piggyback part of the question on someone else's. So someone has asked, um, can you please talk a bit more about what you are working on now? What is the status of the memorial you designed and will it be built? And I wanted to ask um, how writing the book had helped you or influenced your design practice. So maybe those two things go together. Maybe oh, they okay. don't. <laughs> Okay, well, I will first, so this may actually I was doubting whether I'd put it in the presentation or not. But uh, um, so after I wrote the book, I kind of I got more and more interested in this process and also in, uh, in, in war heritage. Mm -hmm. So not uh, cultural heritage buildings, which, you know, by definition, they have, uh, you have all these uh, vanished chart, all kinds of, you know, cultural UNESCO, all, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, systems for protection of cultural heritage. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it still still happens that cultural heritage is destroyed first when, when wars start uh, and go, go on. Uh, but still, they are more or less protected. But there is something I'm interested in specifically and that is war heritage, so symbolic heritage that, is, that war creates. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, in, in the case of Sarajevo again, I mean, I run away from Sarajevo precisely because I'm, I was always too close to the to su subject of Sarajevo. That's why I looked at Europe, you know, just to kind of create distance to understand this whole material better. And now after, what is it now, 16 years, I'm kind of slowly coming back to Sarajevo just naturally because, you know, people call you, I have this project going on and so on. Uh, but I'm now interested in, uh, for example, during the siege of Sarajevo, there was something called uh, war architecture. And that is all. That is also an act of resistance of citizens. So architects from the city suddenly saw their buildings being destroyed. Precisely what's happening in Ukraine now, and you know they had to go to battlefields. They took guns. They had to you know defend from from Serbian army. Uh, but what they did after, I, when I talked with these people, what they did after, for example, being on the first line duty, they would come uh, find some paper and pen, and then they would map how their buildings and other buildings, their colleagues' buildings, were destroyed. So they, mm -hmm. you know, there are professionals who know also how to map this, uh, what was direct hit, what was this, what, what damage was caused and so on. And sometimes citizens also help, so non-architects, let's say. And then they created this project called War Architecture that clandestinely traveled out of Sarajevo and was exhibited in Centre Pompidou, in New York, in Switzerland and so on, just to kind of show the scale of urbicide that was taking place in Sarajevo, you know, because then there was no internet, there was no other media. So th this project, I argue, really had impact because Jacques Chirac, for instance, visited the exhibition in Centre Pompidou and so on, on the course of events in Sarajevo. So I, this is where I'm really interested, and everyone forgot, forgot about it. You can't find anything about this project now. There's really one little archive and I'm trying to collect people to interview them while they're still alive because mm -hmm. I think it's such a heritage. Um, so this is where book got me now to, to be busy with you know, war heritage and how, how can we now preserve this because most of these buildings are also gone. Can we use augmented reality in combination with place memory and design to kind of a, you know, maintain that 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 um, memory of place, yeah, and so on. Oh my God, I'm talking too much. I don't know anymore. But I'm not, <laughs> sorry, I'm just <laughs> yeah. So this is the first the first question that got that led me to, and then the project in Sarajevo is. Uh, so I won the project. The sorry, the the the, the competition. I couldn't believe it, but it's like, again, that was like okay. That, so it made sense to do all this. And um, it's really slow moving process. And this is, I didn't expect nothing else because I see that pro projects of this scale, because these are actually two buildings on two sides of this tunnel, uh, take decades sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not rushing, I'm just looking, for me, this whole, just looking is actually more interesting than building that building. 
because I also proposed it is it's a difficult building because I proposed it uh, I proposed to make it from rammed earth because you know they dug earth to make the tunnel so symbolically returning the earth to the site makes sense mm -hmm. but building a rammed earth is not easy and that also means that it will kind of deteriorate you have to maintain it and so on so I have a lot of negotiation going on you know now in practice so we will see what happens with the project and I, in a way, I answered, I think, your question as well, uh, yeah. because it, it helped me immensely uh, in my own practice. I'm Again, I'm not really interested anymore I, uh, in building buildings. I did that when I was uh, doing practice, like when you finish, when you graduate, you have to work in an office and, you know, I did all that. Uh, and uh, I mean, honestly, for me, it was not inspirational enough. And I have this fascination with making something beyond architecture you know, architecture is a tool for something higher than architecture itself. It's not a goal for me. So I'm, again, uh, more of an observer of these processes of dynamics uh, 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 of remembrance, you know, and sometimes here and there when my palms itch, I try to do a conceptual project for a really complex, intriguing, sometimes impossible task. Um, so this is what I'm more or less doing now. With Amazing. the knowledge I have, and I'm trying to develop it further and become, you know, more informed. That sounds brilliant. And I think we'll all be uh, looking out for your name in some newspaper articles soon. Well, I don't know about <laughs> that, but uh, if you oh. need advice on, on a memorial project, you can always contact me. <laughs> brilliant. Thank you so much, Sabina. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank um, you all. I will email a link to the recording tomorrow, probably, along with a short survey. And if you could take a couple of minutes to fill that out, that would be really helpful. Um, our next event will take place on the 5th of May and will be a talk by Rebecca Clifford entitled Impossible Reconstructions, Families After the Holocaust. So really hope to see you there. Thank you again, Sabina. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank and you all for uh, staying with us. <laughs> Not at all. Have it was fascinating. Night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night.